let's then move on to our final and I'm very proud to say um, uh, to present you our final speaker uh, who's joining us from the United States. She is called uh, Shannon Bragg Sitton. She's with the, uh, the I see you now also, Shannon. Thank you very much. She's with the uh, Idaho National Lab, um, which is, I think, the, the main sort of national lab for nuclear energy research in, in the United States. So um, I'm super happy to have you here. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. I will uh, go ahead and quickly share my screen. Uh, you are correct that uh, Idaho National Laboratory is the nuclear energy laboratory in the U.S. And let me see, are you seeing the full screen version of that? We are indeed, Shannon, yeah. Perfect. Uh, so at INL, I serve as the director for our Integrated Energy and Storage Systems Division. And I also serve as the national technical director for Department of Energy Office of Nuclear Energy Program on Integrated Energy Systems. So today I'd like to give you a little bit of an update of what we've been doing uh, in that program and what I see as a vision for the future. Uh, many of our nations are, are seeking net zero solutions. These are aggressive goals that have been set to achieve net zero electricity by 2035 in the US and then net zero economy wide by 2050. That is a huge challenge, but I think we have a pathway. I think we have a pathway to do this by looking at how we utilize all of our energy sources collectively and through collaboration across uh, our national laboratories and industry uh, globally. So I want to start my presentation with this vision and then give you the pieces that we are working on to achieve this vision. So as you can see in this city of the future, we envision many different applications where we can bring in advanced nuclear technology and co-locate that with hydrogen production and chemical plants and other industrial applications. Utilize renewables available in that area, such as wind and solar, and use that to drive electric transit stations and hydrogen fueling stations for fuel cell vehicles and water desalination plants. Uh, this depicts a remote community that might utilize these sources collectively to ensure a reliable grid and reliable energy supply. But we're also looking at this much uh, on a much grander, larger scale as well. So as many of you are, are quite aware, the paradigm for nuclear energy is changing. Uh, with the advance of, of many new reactor technologies, we're beginning to see not just large scale systems being developed, but also micro megawatt scale and hundreds of megawatt scale small modular reactors that can be deployed to these remote regions or to industrial locations to ensure that we have that reliable energy supply where it is needed and with the footprint that it is needed that allows it to be sited very close to that intended use. So on the left, you see a, a rough footprint of how large the land utilization would be for the various energy sources that can be considered in these uh, future applications. So we really have an opportunity to embrace these advances in nuclear energy and investigate how those can be utilized alongside other clean energy sources to really make substantial progress toward this economy-wide net zero goal. So within the integrated energy systems program that I lead, we, we truly are looking for cross-sectoral energy solutions that we believe will provide opportunities to achieve that net zero goal while simultaneously maintaining grid stability and affordability of our energy supply. Now, if we look at how our energy systems have traditionally been deployed, we see energy generators such as a nuclear plant being solely dedicated to one application, electricity production, for example. Similarly, industrial heat supply is generally provided by a source of heat, such as a, a fossil-based thermal generator. So when we look at these independently, we are often missing opportunities to better utilize that energy. As we see more advances of variable supply, such as wind and solar, this is causing some of our traditionally dispatchable baseload plants, such as nuclear, to operate flexibly to ensure that we don't exceed grid demand and those plants don't uh, produce excess energy and have to sell that at a very low or even negative 
uh, price for that electricity at times. If we instead look at an integrated grid system where we either better coordinate those generators and how they interact with one another in a grid balancing area, or even look to tightly coupled energy parks, we can look at collective use of those resources that we have, whether those be large scale systems like our current light water reactors or very small scale micro reactors. We can begin to understand how the heat generated by those systems and electricity generated by complementary resources as well might be better utilized to serve not just the electricity demand, but also demands for industrial heat and electricity, demands for hydrogen production, clean water, other chemical processes that we can envision. Overall, we are seeking to maximize how we utilize the energy produced by these generators to ensure that they remain profitable, our nuclear plants stay online, and that we maximize that clean energy penetration so that we can minimize environmental impacts. Now, environmental impacts could mean air emissions, and that's what we often think about, but it's also land utilization. So how do we meet those demands with the smallest land and water utilization as possible? And again, our customers want to maintain affordability and want to be sure that they have a reliable and resilient grid under all weather conditions and scenarios. So this is our starting point and how we are looking at utilization of these systems overall. So within this integrated energy systems program, we look at a number of possible integrated system solutions that would leverage nuclear technology, as well as these renewable energy generators to provide electricity and heat. Uh, these integrated systems uh, incorporate thermal, electrical, as well as process intermediates, such as hydrogen, to meet these various energy demands. And on the right, you can see a list of many of the areas that we are investigating and thinking about in how we replace current energy supply with clean energy supply. Now, of course, we have to prioritize how we begin to tackle those uh, specific scenarios, and each of those integrated systems will apply differently in different geographic regions. We have done substantial uh, research in looking at how we integrate these systems for hydrogen production, and I'll talk more about that. We've also looked at case studies for desalination, and we are diving deeper now into how thermal energy storage can play a key role in integrated light water reactors or advanced higher temperature reactors to couple to these downstream processes. Additional case studies we're conducting this year will look at synthetic fuel production so that we can look for transportation solutions that are not just electrification or hydrogen fuel cells, but also look at drop-in liquid fuels that can replace uh, the current fossil-based fuels that, that we do utilize. Now, there will still be some emissions from that, but dramatically reduced when we use captured CO2 sources, as uh, Stefan just uh, discussed in his presentation. Uh, we're also diving into carbon conversion and looking at, as we shift away from these fossil resources, how might we utilize those carbon-based uh, resources that are so fundamental to the economics of some of these regions. Those carbon resources, instead of being burned for electricity production, we can look at converting those to higher value consumer products that we use every day. So those are the, some of the studies that we are uh, diving into, and I'll talk a little bit about the tools and how we're approaching that. First, let's talk a little bit about hydrogen production. Unfortunately, I was not able to listen in on most of the presentations earlier, uh, so I know hydrogen production has been discussed uh, to some extent. Why hydrogen? Well, hydrogen, of course, is a highly versatile energy carrier that's not just a product in itself, but it gives us a means for energy storage, chemical energy storage, a means for electricity production, or a means to support cleaner energy generation or cleaner energy penetration into chemicals and fuel synthesis, things like steel manufacturing or production of ammonia-based fertilizers. And we are looking at ways in which we can take those clean energy generators and deliver electrical energy to drive low temperature PEM electrolysis, or to also incorporate thermal energy provided by those systems to support solid oxide electrolysis cells or high temperature steam electrolysis for even higher efficiency in that hydrogen production. And we're looking at downstream uses, whether that be utilization in uh, transportation in the natural gas pipeline and then utilization in gas turbines to produce electricity, 
utilization in the transportation sector or supporting many of these other hydrogen users. Now, this approach offers us a secondary source of revenue to some of these generators, such as those nuclear plants that are being asked to operate flexibly. And it also allows those plants to maintain operation at their nominal power levels and produce two products, electricity and hydrogen. So this is something we've spent a lot of time looking at in the US. Uh, this is a notional concept of what this might look like in the US Midwest, and in fact is, is a summary of some of the cases we have studied. Now, in this case, we have light water reactors operating a, alongside wind, solar, hydro generation, and we can utilize excess electricity when the grid doesn't need it to electrically in integrate with that PEM electrolysis or to thermally and electrically integrate with steam electrolysis. Again, where that hydrogen goes to the nearby chemicals and fuel fuel synthesis industries to refineries or fertilizer plants or steel plants that are also in those regions. In the Midwest, we also have other regional plants that produce carbon dioxide. So bringing that together with the hydrogen gives us that opportunity for synthetic uh, fuel production as well. Now we are initially focusing on light water reactors, utilization of excess energy from our light water reactor fleet, uh, but that will provide us with a roadmap for how we do these same types of things, co-location of a hydrogen production facility alongside an advanced nuclear plant. Uh, so what we do today by repurposing our current fleet will give us that pathway to do so with advanced reactors as well. Now, how do we do that? How do we begin tackling uh, a, a technical understanding and an economic understanding of all of these opportunities for integrated systems? So I've given a summary here of how we step through that process, and then I'll talk a little bit about the tools that we've developed to conduct that modeling simulation and optimization. Well, first, if we think back to that complex chart and had so many different things on the right side, we need to understand what scenarios are, are of interest to a particular region. We need to know what renewables are available in that region and, and what the renewable build out is currently and what it's anticipated to be going forward. We need to look at the reactor types that might be of interest, uh, whether that be a high temperature gas cooled reactor or a low temperature light water reactor. And we need to understand the various energy needs that might be met by these systems, whether that be provision of a flexible electricity supply, provision of heat, production of hydrogen to go to many customers downstream, or perhaps water purification. We then need to look at what data is necessary to drive each of those scenario evaluations. So we need to understand the societal energy demand. Are those communities growing? What is the variation in electricity demand, heat demand, et cetera? We need to look at approximate plant capacities. How large are those renewable installations that we might couple to? How large of a reactor facility might we be interested in? And then what are the cycles of operation of those systems? What is the refueling cycle? Is it 18 months or is it an advanced reactor that allows for a five or 10 year refueling cycle? What are the planned outages and lifetimes of the independent facilities we're looking at coupling? And what are their maintenance schedules that we need to coordinate? Then we begin to define the economic inputs. So technically achievable is great, but then also needs to be economically viable. So we look at the capital expenditures and the operating costs, as well as the expected variation of electricity prices over time. In many regions in the US, we see uh, negative electricity pricing at times and, and times where it spikes significantly. So we need to understand that uh, variation from a statistical point of view to drive these analyses. And we need to do so on a very regional basis. Uh, in the US, we have a variety of energy markets that we need to evaluate. We need to understand all those market rules in a specific location where this might be deployed. A system that might be viable in the Northeast region of the US may have no viability at all in the Southeast. So we need to understand that uh, and what the drivers are. Only then can we begin to apply the suite of analysis tools to evaluate the technical and economic performance of these systems. And when we do apply that suite of tools, we look to optimal sizing of the coupled systems from a design perspective. How large should my hydrogen production facility be, for example, relative to the size of a renewable installation in a nuclear plant that we're coupling that to? Uh, and what is the demand growth expected in the electricity markets as well? 
And then once designed, we can look at how we would optimally dispatch that energy from each of the resources, uh, as well as looking at operational constraints. How rapidly can we ramp up or ramp down any of these coupled resources? Uh, what is the minimum operating level of our hydrogen production facility or of that downstream user of the hydrogen? So what are those constraints that we need to understand when we're looking at this dynamic operation of the system? And then what are the ranges of the capital expenditures and operating expenditures across the entirety of the plant lifetimes? So all of this data comes together and gives us the ability to apply this suite of tools. Now, several years ago, we looked out and said, how do we do this? How do we tackle these cross-sectoral solutions, recognizing that many energy planning tools focus solely on the electricity sector. They look at independent generators. So we found a gap and we found that we needed to develop some of our own techno-economic assessment tools to support answering these questions. Now, we leverage the tools that are available, capacity expansion tools, for example, uh, to help drive these analyses and then fill in the gaps on the cross-sectoral solutions using this framework for optimization of resources and economics that we have developed uh, at Idaho National Laboratory in partnership with uh, Argonne and Oak Ridge National Laboratories as well here in the U.S. This suite of tools allows us to integrate physical plant modeling with this techno-economic optimization. Now, many of these tools that you see uh, highlighted here are plugins to our Raven Risk Analysis Virtual Environment Tool, which gives us an ability to look at these uh, solutions from a stochastic probabilistic sense. And we use Heron to optimize the techno-economic performance and dispatch of these systems. Hybrid is a repository of dynamic models that allow us to look at a very high fidelity perspective at physical plant processes. So we're not just solving this for a steady state configuration, but also dynamic processes. Teal is a tool that allows us to do the economic analyses and farm is a supervisory control system. I'll note that all of these in the gray boxes are open source tools that are accessible through our IES website that's highlighted here. Uh, Force, that overarching GUI is not yet available as uh, an easy interface, but it's currently in development. But these tools are uh, currently accessible and can be utilized uh, by your organizations. Uh, just a quick example of how we do this. Uh, so we utilize capacity expansion tools to assess what those energy demands might be over a long period of time and use that as a feed into the individual suite of analysis tools for dynamic energy uh, dispatch and design of the system. So in a nutshell, we are looking here at a simplified example of how we might utilize a light water reactor for electricity production. And when that electricity demand is low, how the excess electricity would be diverted to hydrogen production. Now, in this case, we applied a constraint that hydrogen uh, needs to be provided to the hydrogen market at all times. And so despite the variation in grid pricing and how we did dispatch energy to one or the other, we're able to do so by incorporating hydrogen storage. So the pink line down here, you can see hydrogen being produced and stored, and then it's dispatched from that storage system when electricity prices are high and that nuclear plant is being called on to support the electricity grid. So just a quick nutshell of, of what those analyses are. And these analyses, these preliminary uh, studies have been used to drive industry partners to decide to invest in demonstration. So in short, we have four nuclear hydrogen production demonstration projects that are underway in the United States using our current fleet plants. Uh, the first in, uh, in line is the Exelon demonstration that will occur at the Nine Mile Point nuclear plant. This system will utilize electric integration behind the grid to drive low temperature electrolysis. Uh, and that is, uh, they are installing hardware right now and they should begin operation very soon. Uh, the second system will be the, uh, uh, again, a low temperature electrolysis system installed at the davis Bessey nuclear plant operated by Energy Harbor in Ohio. Uh, this again uh, is a PEM electrolysis system. These are 
both fairly small in scale. Uh, the different plants have a different design and they uh, approach that electrical integration behind the grid a little bit differently. And they both operate in very different energy markets in the US. So that will drive how they vary production of hydrogen a bit differently. And they're working with different vendors as well. <clears throat> Where I start to get really excited is with the third one listed here, and that's an Excel energy demonstration where they will utilize high temperature steam electrolysis to thermally and electrically integrate that hydrogen production at one of their two plants that operates in Minnesota. So that will be at the Prairie Island or the Monticello nuclear plant. Uh, they are moving forward in that and doing their design uh, right now and, and selecting a vendor to provide those solid oxide electrolysis cells. Again, a fairly small scale uh, demonstration, but that will take huge steps forward in demonstrating the co-location and integration approaches for nuclear and hydrogen. This final project was just awarded last fall. All of these are cost shared projects between the Department of Energy and uh, industry. The Arizona Public Service uh, demonstration at the Palo Verde Generating Station will be the first to take it to larger scale. So while these previous ones will be on the hundreds of kilowatt uh, scale for energy offtake, this will be on the megawatt and multi-megawatt scale for the hydrogen production. And that hydrogen will be um, transported in the natural gas pipelines and utilizing gas peaking turbines. So again, we're really moving forward quite a bit in these demonstrations. Now, I heard a question just as I joined earlier with regard to, can you really thermally integrate steam electrolysis with a nuclear plant? So I quickly dropped another slide in here to show you uh, that we are doing that. As I mentioned, the first demonstration will be at, the, at one of the Excel Energy nuclear plants in Minnesota. Now, how you accomplish this may vary based on the specific uh, reactor design and how that plant owner and operator would like to accomplish it. So this is just one way that is shown where we can have steam pulled off and going to a thermal energy delivery system to isolate that nuclear plant and the steam electrolysis system. Now, if you'd like to dig in a little bit more on what has been done on this, I'll note that we have completed a generic probabilistic risk assessment on licensing considerations associated with this type of integration. And the findings from that study were that uh, co-location within a kilometer between a light water reactor and a high temperature electrolysis facility uh, was feasible. The licensing criteria was met uh, and, and this would not require a license amendment or changes. And so that safety case is quite achievable. And there is a report available for download uh, at the link here uh, that summarizes that probabilistic risk assessment. Now we're not just working and, and pushing forward into the nuclear plant, but we also have an electrically heated facility that allows us to look at these integrated energy systems from a number of perspectives, allows us to look at integration approaches, heat exchanger uh, designs, control systems, operational scenarios uh, that are nominal as well as off nominal. So within this laboratory at Idaho National Lab, we look at uh, producing thermal energy in a way that emulates a, a reactor. So this large chamber at the bottom is a vacuum chamber, really just an environmental chamber for a micro reactor uh, test article that is then coupled to a thermal energy distribution system that incorporates thermal energy storage and distribution of energy to other users. On the right, you see one of our hydrogen production systems that allows us to test solid oxide electrolysis cell performance, different stack performance, and we have larger scale systems that sit just outside of this high bay lab as well. Uh, we also connect that to a human system simulation lab that allows us to understand that control room interface. How are these nuclear plant operators now going to manage these multiple energy flows? Uh, from this reactor that has traditionally only produced electricity. And that sits in a lab just across the street and is connected uh, to these hardware facilities. Also in the laboratory, we have power hardware and grid in the loop technologies that allow us to understand how these inter integrated systems will operate uh, within a microgrid infrastructure or as a system that interfaces with a much larger grid balancing area. So we can emulate all of that with the hardware in the laboratory. And we can also use these real-time digital simulators to connect to facilities 
uh, elsewhere, either in the US or around the world. Uh, and I show here that we are directly connected with real-time communications to facilities at the Renewable Energy Laboratory, as well as our National Energy Technology Laboratory that further extends our ability to demonstrate more of these types of integrated systems. And just a quick overhead shot of what that laboratory looks, uh, looks like. You can see that we have significant co-location. We also include uh, fast charging systems, so we can look at the, the impact of significant changes in electricity demands that are also a part of this integrated system. You can see the thermal systems in the center, one of our hydrogen systems in the back, with the others sitting just outside the wall here that would be right at the bottom of the slide, and our power systems and microgrid system, excuse me, over on the right of the, uh, the slide. Now, where are we moving forward with advanced reactors and how are we uh, looking to integrate these energy users or heat users uh, with advanced reactors? I want to highlight another program called the National Reactor Innovation Center, NREC, that was established in 2020. Now, the purpose of NREC is to accelerate demonstration and commercialization of advanced reactors by really connecting and bridging the gap between research and commercial deployment. Now, NREC is working with a number of advanced reactor developers to demonstrate technologies by the mid-2020s. To do so, we are working to repurpose facilities that already exist at Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, some of you may have visited the lab. We are very large uh, from a land perspective. We have 890 square miles and have tested more than 50 different reactors on the INL site. So these two test beds are looking to be are, are being repurposed to support demonstration of advanced re reactors that are being developed today. Uh, specifically, the dome facility it allows testing of micro reactors up to 20 megawatts thermal, and the Lotus facility is a bit smaller but allows uh, different fuel types to be utilized. Now, why am I talking about this here with regard to integrated systems? Well, we are actively designing a system that will allow heat offtake from those reactors demonstrated in dome to demonstrate what this would look like from a dynamic thermal en energy utilization perspective as well. So we not only can enable neutronic demonstrations of these systems, but also how the energy from the systems would be utilized. We're also working to uh, design and build the first micro reactor uh, in the US. Now, MARVEL is uh, Microreactor Applications Research Validation and Evaluation. MARVEL, much easier to say, uh, is a DOE designed system. It is not equivalent to any of the microreactors being commercially developed, but design and implementation of this system really does help us to get ready for those commercial endeavors. So they have already built and uh, begun testing an electrically heated prototype for this micro reactor, which helps us to validate uh, flow and heat transfer, we get begin getting our our operators ready to get the supply chain ready for this. And the actual nuclear fueled system uh, is expected to be complete in December of 2022. So at the end of this calendar year, with first criticality at the end of the next calendar year. And this will be sited at Idaho National Lab at our transient reactor test facility. Uh, which you see here from an overhead shot. Now, the marble reactor will help us to, to work through many of those processes in building a micro reactor, but it also gives us a small scale uh, demonstration of a nuclear microgrid, and will also support demonstration of coupled energy users such as hydrogen production and desalination. And again, we're actively working in that design right now. So those advanced reactors are progressing uh, quite readily. Uh, as you probably heard in some of the previous talks, there are a number of developers that are working to advance uh, reactor technologies around the world today. This timeline really puts into perspective how much is going on right now. So I just mentioned the Marvel facility that will be located here at INL that'll be, that expects to be operational by the end of the next calendar year the Dome and Lotus test facilities by NREC that will be demonstrating uh, advanced reactors by the mid-2020s. We also have Department of Defense activities that are ongoing that will also look at mobile microreactors. And then we march up this chain and see Southern Company and TerraPower demonstrations, Kairos, uh, 
X energy, Oklo, Natrium, also Terra Power here, all the way up to a commercial facility uh, that would be deployed by new scale uh, by the end of the decade. So there's significant amount of work going on, and we are working actively with these vendors to ensure that we have these integrated system options as well. As I mentioned, we're moving forward in a number of case studies, and these do focus on advanced reactors rather than the light water reactors that we have previously been studying. And as I mentioned early in the presentation, the three studies that we are uh, highlighting for this year focus on utilization of thermal energy storage components to help us support both electrical markets and industrial integration, synthetic fuel production so that we can utilize some of that hydrogen and captured CO2 uh, to produce high value synthetic fuels, and then carbon conversion, looking to convert those carbon based feedstocks into valuable products uh, that can go into a number of markets. Now, some of you may be aware of, of the many international efforts uh, that also focus on uh, similar applications. I'm highlighting here just one of those activities that is under the Clean Energy Ministerial, and this is the Nuclear Innovation Clean Energy Future Initiative, or NICE Future. Uh, and this initiative really does uh, look to bring a number of countries together to share best practices and communications and community engagement and ensuring that nuclear energy is considered alongside other clean energy generators as different countries and organizations look to plan their future energy systems. So we'd love to, to tell you more about that and get you engaged if you're not already. So finally, I'm gonna end on this. This is where we started. This is a potential city of the future. Let's be creative, let's be innovative on how we can address these energy needs and utilize our clean energy generators, nuclear, renewables, et cetera, to drive these uh, energy demands and get us to net zero. So thank you very much. I uh, see that I'm at the end of my time and uh, welcome any questions. Well, thank you so much, um, Shannon. That's a, that's, a, that's a terrific presentation and it's so impressive what you do at um, IDEO National Lab. Um, and I really recommend people to, to sort of explore your website. Uh, There's a wealth of information there. But um, uh, before we get people to go there, I'd like to post you, you know, just a, a few questions. Um, the first one is, you know, we talked about many of these applications and, and some of which are, can be applied to sort of the existing reactive designs and some require, mm -hmm. I guess, or would be would benefit from from new designs. And would you could you sort of um, the the majority of these applications are they applicable to existing the existing nuclear fleet or would you say that most of these uh, sort of beyond electricity applications are are more relevant for for smaller scale or, or more advanced reactor types so it's an excellent question and i think it has a multifaceted answer so why are we looking at light water reactors to begin with uh, there's historically uh, been an expectation that you don't do hydrogen production, for example, with a light water reactor because the temperatures don't match. It doesn't make sense. But in fact, we can use heat augmentation techniques to get to those higher temperatures that, that is required for high temperature electrolysis, for example. And there are really good economic solutions to uh, some of the challenges that those current fleet plants are seeing, which is why we have so many demonstrations that are moving forward. Now, is that the most efficient way to achieve high temperature hydrogen production or to provide high temperature heat to a coupled chemical facility? It may not be, but we also have to remember that these operating nuclear plants, for the most part, are paid. Those are capital investments that have been made decades ago. And so the cost looks a little bit different. Now, if we were to build systems today, would it be better to build a light water reactor, a large scale gigawatt scale system to couple to industrial processes? Or would it make more sense to build a right size small modular reactor that produces heat at the temperature demanded by that industry? Well, I think if we were starting from a, a green field, we would choose to go with the advanced smaller scale system that better matches the application. <clears throat> But that doesn't mean those light water reactors are not applicable. Even if the temperatures don't match exactly, we can look at electric heating to boost temperatures of steam. We can look at chemical heat pumps. We can do different things from an engineering design perspective to get to those temperatures and bridge the gap 
between what we have today in our current fleet and those advanced reactors that are going to be coming online uh, within the next decade or two. So, so, so building on that answer there, what, would you say this is is um, kind of a two pronged strategy? One is to improve the the business case, for lack of a better word, or, or improve the economics and and use those those past investments to the to the greatest advantage. On the one hand, so 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 retrofitting or using existing mm-hmm. fleet for new applications. Um, or is it also, or or perhaps even more so, to to sort of meet demands that are currently not met with the, with the existing energy solutions, uh, where you can use different reactor designs and and sort of find ways to to decarbonize or or improve ro- the robustness of the system in ways that we we currently don't do. Yeah, I think we can't choose one or the other. I think that we have such a challenge ahead of us to ensure that we have clean energy supply. Uh, as I said at the beginning, economy-wide, not just electricity, but also heat, transportation, et cetera. So it's really not choosing one or the other. It's about going with a multifaceted approach, better utilizing the investments we've already made with our light water reactor fleet and repurposing those systems to uh, meet the demand in a particular area, to meet electricity demand, to meet hydrogen demand, to support transport of heat to nearby industrial locations. And as I said, that helps us bridge that gap. It helps us to work through the challenges of co-location from a public perception aspect, from a regulatory aspect, to make it easier for advanced reactors to do that from day one and to do so more efficiently than a light water so, reactor can support. Yeah, and, and um, I guess before, you know, earlier today, and I, I think you didn't, you probably weren't, awake by that time but we talked a little bit about smr and the the economics of, of those and i think that there's um at least i'm often you know more used to talking about the levelized cost of electricity and and you know comparing cost of different technologies to produce that one product you know the, the electricity one mm-hmm. would you say that the sort of the economics of of um say in a more advanced reactor of an smr could be sort of dramatically improved by by if you consider these as sort of additional applications that go beyond electricity or is it or is it more just sort of a, on the margins? I think it can be improved significantly and, and we're trying to change that that mentality of thinking about levelized cost of electricity <clears throat> to being more of a levelized cost of energy. We don't look at those cross sections. If a nuclear plant is not competing in the electricity grid right now, that doesn't mean that it couldn't compete and and have this, the substantial revenue streams from also competing in the heat markets. And we just don't look at it that way. I think in some cases, it will be a significant advantage, not just sitting on the margins, but we have to change some of that, uh, that paradigm on how we evaluate these systems. I mentioned that our traditional systems that we look, that we utilize to look out uh, in the future, such as capacity expansion models, only look to electricity. They don't have an avenue to also include heat applications and revenues from those heat applications in that comparative assessment of our energy options. We need to change that. And we are working with a number of organizations that that have these types of models to understand how do we change that? How do we bring in these other applications? How do we bring in advanced reactors to ensure that they are being accurately represented rather than using uh, some of the costs and, and investment uh, investments that have been made historically in light water reactors, because I think we we can see that if we are building a very large scale system, it has a very different economic uh, investment timeline. So the capital expenditure is very very high up front, but if we look at modular systems, it's quite different. It's spread over a different amount of time. We can look at factory fabrication. Uh, that changes some of those economics. And so we need to ensure that those models that are being used incorporate all of these technological technology advancements and opportunities to make sure that that we're we're evaluating it correctly. But bottom line, I don't think we're on the margins for many of these applications. We're very much uh, in competing technologies. And we have to remember there aren't that many clean energy sources that provide thermal energy in a dispatchable fashion. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon <clears throat> Briggs-Sidden from the IDEO National Lab. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thanks for taking the time.